Unlike most tools, these five hydraulic troubleshooting tools will quite literally pay for themselves the very first time they are used. The first tool is a good pressure test kit. The kit should include at a minimum one low pressure and one high pressure gauge. By low pressure we mean 0 to 1000 psi and by high pressure we mean 0 to 3000. Of course, some systems will operate at a high enough pressure to need a 0 to 6000 psi gauge. Small hoses and fittings should be included so that the gauges can be mounted wherever they're needed. Remember that the pressure gauge for a hydraulic technician is comparable to a voltmeter for an electrician or e &I tech, and most systems have only one gauge at the power supply. This is fine for measuring system pressure, but it can't tell us anything about pressures in any of the lines downstream. Paper mills in particular usually have test ports already mounted in the manifolds so that the technician can insert the portable gauge at various points to measure pressure and quickly track down a pressure loss. We may also need to know the pressure at some point in the hydraulic plumbing that is not in the valve manifold. That's no problem, there are pressure test ports available that can be mounted in any hose, pipe, or tubing so that pressure can be read immediately whenever it would be valuable for troubleshooting. These gauges, fittings, and test ports are quite inexpensive, but they are invaluable to the hydraulic troubleshooter. They can also be used to take oil samples or release pressure in a hydraulic line to make the system safe to perform maintenance and repair. Another quite valuable tool is a flow meter. This tool is never used to its full potential, but to have it installed is almost like having x-ray eyes like Superman. We can't see through walls, hydraulic lines, or manifolds, but we can measure the flow traveling through them with a flow meter, which makes this tool the next best thing, and most people seem to think that a flow meter is unnecessary if there is a pressure gauge. We believe that this is the result of a failure to fully understand the difference between pressure and flow. Pumps are often replaced because the pressure is low. This is usually a mistake since the pump does not pump pressure. The pump delivers a rate of flow. This flow is met by a resistance and hopefully overcomes it. The result of this is pressure. In the schematic, the hand valve is shown fully open, allowing flow to be delivered to the drum. There's no significant resistance, so the gauge reads zero PSI. In this figure, the hand valve is closed. The pressure then builds until it overcomes the resistance of the relief valve spring, which is set at 500 PSI. The gauge now indicates 500 PSI, and the pump flow returns the zinc to the relief valve. The gauge tells us the total resistance in the system, but cannot tell us how much flow is being delivered by the pump. A flow meter should be permanently installed in the case drain of any variable displacement pump so that pump wear can be easily tracked. Case flow is the fluid that is bypassed across the very tight tolerances inside the pump. We recommend that the case flow be measured and recorded at least once per month since ambient temperature will have an effect on the flow. The higher the fluid temperature, the lower its viscosity will be and the more case flow will pass. The first year that the case drain is measured, it will be noted that case flow will increase with temperature. System pressure will also cause case flow to increase by an amount proportional to the pressure. So it would be wise to monitor each case drain monthly and record the minimum and the maximum flow through a complete machine cycle, thus giving us a benchmark of what is normal for August as well as what's normal for February and every other month. Most pump manufacturers include normal ranges for case flow in their documentation. In order to understand fully how case flow tells us that the pump is serviceable, we must first understand how the pump functions. The example we chose was a pressure compensating piston pump. While most mills have a wide variety of pumps, all paper mills use piston pumps. The piston pump has a barrel that is turned by a shaft. Pistons are mounted on the barrel and as the barrel turns, the pistons are stroked by a cam or swash plate. In this first example, only one piston is shown to demonstrate how the piston is stroked. 
A spring holds the cam ring at its maximum angle so long as the system pressure is below the setting of the pump compensator, 1200 PSI in this example. Once the pressure builds to the compensator setting, the compensator valve will shift to deliver flow to the destroking cylinder. This moves the swash plate to a reduced angle which limits the stroke of the pistons and reduces the flow to only the amount needed to maintain the compensator setting at the pump outlet. When the flow is blocked, as would happen when all directional valves are closed and the system is in idle condition, the destroking cylinder moves the swash plate to the full vertical position. In this position, the pistons do not stroke at all, so the pump delivers no flow. System pressure is maintained at 1200 PSI, and any drop in system pressure will cause the pump to stroke and keep the pressure up. As the pistons stroke, oil will bypass across the tight tolerances between the pistons and the barrel. This bypassed oil fills the pump case and returns the tank through the case drain. As the pump wears, case flow will increase. With a flow meter mounted permanently in the case drain, pump wear can be easily monitored. On the rare occasions we find flow meters mounted on equipment, the case drain is usually where we find it. While it can be quite valuable to monitor a pump's condition, it can only tell us how the pump wear compares to the previous times it was measured. If a pump's condition is unknown when the flow meter is first installed, the pump could still fail unexpectedly. A good rule of thumb is that a new pump will usually bypass 1-3% to of its total flow, and it should usually be changed once the flow reaches 10%, but this is not a hard and fast rule. A flow meter in the pressure line can tell us immediately and conclusively whether a pump is good or bad. This method can be used on either fixed or variable displacement pumps. If a pressure compensating pump is being tested, the compensator should be turned fully clockwise to its highest setting. This will cause the pump to behave as a fixed displacement pump, constantly delivering its maximum flow. The pump flow should be deadheaded and forced across the system relief valve. Before starting the pump, turn the relief valve adjustment to a very low pressure, fully counterclockwise until no spring tension is felt. When the pump is turned on, it will deliver its flow across the relief valve at a very low pressure. Even a badly worn pump will deliver all or nearly all of its flow when it's met with no resistance. Begin increasing the pressure on the relief valve and watch the flow meter. If the flow is maintained when the pressure is increased to normal system operating pressure, the pump is good and need not be replaced. If, however, the flow drops significantly as the pressure is increased, the pump is badly worn and has to be replaced. There are numerous other components that can be diagnosed with a flow meter. Any actuator that is moving more slowly than it should is either badly worn or not having the required amount of flow delivered. A flow meter can tell immediately which is the problem, but most plants would consider flow meters in every hydraulic line a bit excessive and I would have to agree. If the tool budget allows, a portable non-invasive flow meter can be used to measure the flow rate of any hydraulic line, whether it's a metal pipe or a hose. These are quite expensive for hydraulic systems, but would not have to save very many hours of downtime to justify their cost. If it's decided to take the leap of expense, be sure that the one you purchase is intended for industrial hydraulic circuits. Since most of them measure the velocity of particulates in the liquid, the less expensive models will not work on industrial systems because hydraulic oil must be kept too clean for the particulate matter to be detected. Thermal imaging infrared cameras have dropped significantly in price in the last few years. They're worth their weight in gold, however, for finding temperature gains. They're more accurate and much easier to use than laser temperature guns. And certain temperature gains, such as inside of a manifold, are difficult, if not impossible, to confirm without the infrared camera. The first indication of impending failure of any hydraulic component is an increase in heat. This is because, by and large, when a hydraulic component fails, it leaks. 
Sometimes it leaks out on the floor, and the problem is obvious, but most of the time the leakage is internal, which we call bypassing. Bypassing is always accompanied by a pressure drop. Any pressure drop that does no useful work generates heat because the energy intended to move a load is released locally. The manifold pictured has an unloading valve mounted on the top. The particular circuit was losing pressure when the pump should have been loaded. Clearly, in the infrared photo, heat is being generated at the valve. A voltage detector can show instantly if a solenoid is being energized. When a directional valve will not shift, we must first determine if electrical power is being delivered to the solenoid. The voltage detector will light up when the voltage is sensed. Another option is to use a steel ruler. Whenever a solenoid is energized, if it's functioning properly, a magnetic field will be generated. The ruler will be attracted to the solenoid. If no magnetic field is present, either the solenoid is not being energized or the coil is burned out. It's not at all uncommon for a lot of troubleshooting time to be spent on servo or proportional valves trying to determine whether there is an electrical or a hydraulic problem. Often the symptoms will be identical. The fastest way to tell is to isolate the valve from its electrical control and drive it from an outside source to see if the valve function changes. Any company that manufactures servo or proportional valves will also make test boxes for them. The box shown is a universal box with a connector terminal at the front. If you have a number of valves that use the same amplifier card, a brand specific box will usually have a slot that plugs directly to the card. The servo analyzer isolates the servo both electrically and hydraulically to determine its condition. There are also portable analyzers, often called battery boxes or diddle boxes, for diagnosing valves without removing them from the system. 